Hi my lovelies, before we jump headfirst into another true crime video, I wanted to take a moment to thank my amazing sponsor, Contravy, who is making something really special possible, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Contravy is a membership platform that allows content creators like me to collect contributions from my supporters without paying any fees, unlike on other platforms. You can subscribe, or you can make one-off donations to help me reach a particular goal. This is in exchange for exclusive content such as podcasts, reductions on event prices, or special editions of my branded merchandise. <laughs> to mark me becoming part of this amazing Contribute community, I have decided to set myself a goal of raising £2,000 for the big mental health charity that I am patron of. Big is genuinely an inspirational organisation that benefits so many people who are struggling with mental health issues and acute mental distress. And I am blessed to have a hands-on role running group sessions voluntarily with this awesome charity. What makes this goal extra special is that whatever I manage to raise, Contrib will then double that amount, meaning that your donation will have twice as much impact. To join Contrib, and to become one of my supporters, click on the description and become part of the fabulous Contrib community. Now, on with tonight's true crime. Welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thank you very much for joining me. If this is your first time here, I release crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. Religiously, deep dives, every single week, twice a week. So if you like crime and you like consistency, I am your girl. Also, thanks everybody for your likes, your comments, your subscriptions, and if you haven't subscribed yet, then do it now. Just watch it if you want first and then do it, but just at some point do it you'll want to, then you'll never miss an episode. And like I said, get those notifications on so you're reminded of that. Now, the case I'm gonna cover today, wow. Wow. Samuel Little. And I know that a lot of you have asked for this and I am gonna be covering Ted Bundy for my 100th episode because there was a vote and that was the one that won. But a lot of you have said that you'd really like to find out more about Samuel Little. I'm actually quite surprised that there isn't loads out there on him as far as documentaries, etc. Because Samuel Little was a huge serial killer. His body count is bigger than most. I'm gonna take you all the way through. So buckle in because I'm swearing this is gonna be a very long one. I may be wrong, maybe I'll speak at double speed and we'll get there in the normal time, but it is pretty lengthy research-wise and I can't imagine it's not gonna be transpiring that it will be the same on this video. Samuel Little, who was actually originally known as Samuel McDowell, he was born on the 7th of June, 1940 in Georgia. According to Little, his mum was a teenage prostitute and the authorities believe that she may have actually given birth to him while she was in jail. And Little claims that she left him by the side of the road as a baby. So I guess if that story is true, and we can never always tell whether it's entirely true because we do realise that all of our serial killers are also pathological liars, but nonetheless, I think before we kick off with the intricate details of this case, it would be worth noting that if Samuel Little's mother was a prostitute who abandoned him, that could early on have created a level of rage towards that particular population of women. The sense of abandonment, the attachment issues, and the genuine sense that he was throw away and wanting to reap his revenge consistently and persistently on his mother by taking it out on the other prostitutes that he eventually murdered. It's a theory. 
I'm not saying it's the reality, but it certainly would make sense. So because of this apparent abandonment, he ended up being mainly raised by his grandmother in Lorraine County, Ohio. It seems that from a really early age, there was a fascination that Little developed and this fascination certainly seemed to play out and characterize his later crimes. And some reports actually suggest that this particular fetish, so to speak, began in kindergarten. And it was when one of his kindergarten teachers touched her neck. But even though that's in some reports, Littles told others that it began around his third grade class. And he described it as being in a situation where a little girl who had red ringlets stared at him with wide green eyes and touched her neck. And he claimed that when she did that, it was because she sensed his weakness and that she would actually taunt him. And it was this that really kind of provoked him to feel this level of obsession with this particular area of the body. So from this point onwards, he just became completely obsessed with choking people, strangling and choking women. This is really early on. And he actually had sexual fantasies very, very early on about this as a child. Also, he was interested in crime per se. So he read true crime magazines. Yes, guys, he read true crime magazines. Hands up how many people also read true crime magazines. A little bit disconcerting to imagine that serial killers are just there, you know, flicking the pages thinking, hmm, what do I want to do next? But nonetheless, it shows that early on he had this fixation and that his particular predilection, shall we say, when he was reading these true crime magazines was being about reading women being strangled to death. So that would be where he would spend his time. He'd look for stories about strangulation because that would essentially give him some kind of sexual experience. And it seems like this is very much the beginning of a throat fetish that would just go on to claim countless lives. I mean, countless lives. And these fantasies, as I said, started done in school. And so he started early on fantasizing about actually murdering the girls in his class. And this fetish didn't ebb, it intensified. And he would literally have to avoid looking at the necks of his peers or his friends or even members of his own family because he had this compulsion. And the compulsion was that he wanted to hurt people, but because they were people within, I suppose, his inner circle, his family, etc. He didn't want to hurt people that he loved. So again, it's an interesting situation, isn't it? Because he's using terms like love and the fact that he can restrain himself from harming those closest to him. So he can certainly control the impulse in spite of it being challenging for him. He didn't do well at school. He did struggle academically and he was frequently in trouble throughout his high school in particular, and he actually dropped out of high school. And being in frequent trouble is definitely part of his MO. It's just a part of his experience. He was constantly throughout his life getting in more and more serious trouble. Like a lot of serial killers, most of them in fact, when you look at their histories, he had a very similar experience. You know, his criminal life started when he was very young. These began with minor offences. He used to commit petty thefts. He used things like stealing to just go and make him be able to buy drinks or drugs. So he used it for that kind of purpose. When he was 13, he stole a bicycle. And at this point, it resulted in him being sent to the boys industrial school. Now what that is, it's a reform school. It was in Lancaster, Ohio. And even though this was a place that was really, I suppose, meant to reform people, it didn't really work with respect. It's a little bit like bore stalls that we used to have in the UK, where you'd be sent to this school for naughty boys, basically. And what would you experience? Oh, loads of other naughty boys who scare me or beat me up or who I have to act in a certain way to get approval of. Probably not the best breeding ground for pro-social behavior. And likewise, this particular reform school didn't do anything to stem his fantasies or his violence. And ultimately it almost led to him graduating to violent offenses against people. So we're seeing now his experience and identity with incarceration, and it didn't seem to bother him that much. And that's 
really important to note because a lot of people, when they experience being locked up or their freedom taken away from them, the consequences of that are so dire that it makes you really think about not doing things again. At least that's the intention. When people don't feel that consequence, well, that can lead to them making decisions about their behavior that are really negative for society because they're not really concerned about what happens if they get caught. His first experience of actually getting incarcerated, as in imprisoned, well, that happened when he was 16. So still really early on. And this conviction occurred after it broken into a property in Nebraska. He actually got four years in juvenile detention. So that's quite a long time, isn't it? At 16, you know, you're talking about a large portion of your life there. But again, it didn't seem to have any intended consequences on changing his behavior. He then moved to Florida, and this kind of begins what I would consider a very nomadic lifestyle. I'm not talking about nomadic lifestyle in the kind of, yeah, hippies, free love, chilling out by the beach, just hanging around, that kind of nomadic lifestyle. That's kind of the nomadic lifestyle I want. But I'm talking about nomadic as in he never really has roots. He's constantly moving from place to place. And I want you to think about that, how that nomadic lifestyle actually plays into his crimes. Because if you're not in a place for a very long time and you're moving on perpetually, well, it's going to be very difficult for the police to find you. But during this experience of beginning this nomadic lifestyle in Florida, he ends up getting arrested a variety of times for a variety of offences. And it kind of stems from Florida across several states that he travels to. And this basically marks the emergence of his future MO. So that future MO would be to travel across state lines to commit his crimes. And his crimes were quite wide to some degree. The offences ranged from driving over the limits and solicitation to armed robbery and rape. So he was kind of a fingers in every kind of crime type of guy. But also that shows a real tenacity for a criminal life, doesn't it? I mean, he's not really concerned about his future. He's concerned about his immediacy, his presence, what's happening now, what he needs to get through it. He would frequently shoplift and then he was known to sell stolen goods from the boot of his car in fact a lot of people recall him doing that and i do believe his car was relatively grubby as well i don't think it was a valeted type car it was more of a disgustingly dirty type car but nonetheless he was probably living in it a lot so arguably that would be why but this shoplifting and this selling the goods it helped him to fund basically his more serious criminal exploits. So what he would do was he would spend a few days in a city shoplifting, getting these goods, then he'd sell the loot, and then he'd basically spend the nights hunting for victims. And I use the word hunting for victims because he was absolutely a predator. He was a wild animal when it comes down to being a human. He was a human predator every single day of the week. So after he gets out of juvenile detention, that's at the age of 21, he ends up serving another three years. This is when he's convicted of a burglary of a Lorraine furniture store. This is his first experience of adult prison. And you can imagine that would be a shock to anybody's system, but it doesn't seem to be too problematic for him. And in fact, this is where he first starts to draw he likes drawing, and this will play out later on when we talk about his victims. After his release in 1964, he gets arrested a further 26 times during the following 11 years, which drives me mad because when I am going to outline some of the early offenses, as in to do with victims, you are all gonna be sitting at home thinking, how many failures? How is this guy? on our streets. Look, I thought I knew this case, like all of you. Whenever there is anything about a serial killer, I am reading about it. And I thought I had a good grip on what had actually occurred. And this a massive amount of time that was essentially passed before he got caught. And I imagined that there were good reasons for that, that, you know, it was difficult to pin crimes on him. No, not the case. When I tell you about this, you're all going to be like, what? 
This man was free? How did he ever get free from even his initial crimes? It's as simple as that. I will say he did have a relationship in this period. And he had like a pretty solid relationship. He had his constant partner and it, she was a constant in his life. You know, this is an nomadic man. He's in and out of jail. He's constantly involved in crime. And we also know that he's an individual with a strong predisposition for harm. So like a lot of our serial killers, particularly organized ones, in spite of the fact that there were all these things in his world, it didn't mean that he couldn't have an intimate relationship with a partner. And you'll think about many of our serial killers like BTK and the Green River Killer and so on and so forth. They had long-term partners. So Jean was constantly with Little. And by all accounts, she was considerably older than him. So maybe she represented a maternal figure as well. And as we know, he didn't like to harm people that he loved. So she would basically follow him on his travels from state to state. He did avoid the temptation to kill her with respect, but he did subject her to physical abuse. She was an ally in his crimes. So she was a partner in crime, basically. She constantly supported him by shoplifting. And he described her with great pride, I will tell you, as a master shoplifter. He didn't have her involved in any of the other crimes. So the ones I'm gonna talk about regarding murder, but the authorities think that she absolutely was aware of them. And I think that we can't absolutely say that she was because she died of an aneurysm in the late 1980s, but that's their suspicion. Having said that, we have all heard of many cases where partners, literally even partners who were involved in the more criminal side of their other half's lives, still didn't realize they were going about killing people. And this can happen, but nonetheless, the authorities think that she probably did have an awareness of that. A little bit like Tyra, when it comes down to, you know, Eileen Wernos, shall we say. Let's not pretend she didn't know about it, guys. Just my opinion, just my opinion. So 1982, this is when I'm gonna start expressing and explaining to you the arrests and also gonna sound shocked consistently because literally, how did this guy get to kill so many people when he began in 1982 coming to the authorities' awareness for not small crimes? So 1982, Little is first arrested for the murder of 22-year-old Melinda Rose Lapry. So he's actually charged with the death of her. But for some reason, case never goes to trial. And it feels like that is also a real trigger for him. Here he is accused of and charged with the murder of this 22 year old woman and it doesn't actually get to trial. No consequences again. And it feels like what was always on Samuel Little's side was that the justice system allowed him constantly to avoid it. And it was a recurrent theme, genuinely, in Little's life. So after he's been charged, but not found guilty or tried in the end of this murder, he's then extradited to Florida in connection with another murder. So we now have two possible people that he's killed. And that murder potential was of 26 year old Patricia Ann Mount. What happens? Even though he's extradited to face the consequences for this potential murder, gets dropped. It's acquitted because they feel that they didn't have witnesses that were credible enough. Not that he didn't do it, but they didn't have credible witnesses. You know, they couldn't have taken the stand. People wouldn't have believed them. So he just gets to walk away from that. He then moves to California. In late 1984, he then attacks 22-year-old Laurie Barris. Now, she actually survives with respect, and because she survived, and actually because she went forward and spoke to the authorities about him, and rightfully so. So Laurie describes the attack, and it happened on the 26th of September, 1984. She's basically just walking to her friend's apartment. This is when Little approaches her from behind, and he literally put her in a chokehold and dragged her into his car. I mean, how shocking is that? When you think about what could befall you when you're walking down the street, I mean, that is as far from where we go, isn't it, in our heads. 
that is your absolute horror film moment. So she's just dragged into this car. He then drives her to an abandoned lot. It's actually used as an illegal dumping site. Pulls her into the back seat by her neck and shoulders. And then he begins forcibly kissing her, which is one of those things that I think victims really struggle with. I mean, rape per se is just the most horrific experience for anybody, but that forcible kissing, kissing is one of those things that's deeply intimate. It's shared by individuals who are attracted to one another and by partners and so on and so forth. And the fact that he's almost trying to, in that moment, forge some kind of intimate connection. This is with a victim he is literally dragged off the street. It's horrific. She, understandably, tries to push him away. He gets angry because obviously he's about possession, ownership, dominance. How dare she? How dare she reject him? And it's at this point he begins to choke her. And she says this, one hand all the way around with his thumb right in the middle and started controlling my ability to breathe. She then asks him, obviously, please don't hurt me. She says that she'll cooperate if he wants to rape her. And Little actually said to her, he didn't want to hurt her and to trust him and that he loved her. I mean, Samuel Little, we need to have a word about what love represents. But we also need to hear it, don't we? Because it's very easy for us all to go, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, he didn't know her. So how could he have loved her? But we have to actually accept that he may well have in that moment have experienced the only thing that for him represented that connection. For him, this is love. For us, it's horror. But for him, potentially, he loved doing it. Therefore, he transfers that onto his victim, telling her that somehow this represents something intimate. He pulls off her tights, underwear and shoes. He then tied her hands behind her back with the hosiery, with the tights. And it's at this point he says that he wants her to swallow. He said that he likes to feel it when she swallowed while his thumb was over her neck. And she said that it basically became a game. So it was just something he was playing. So just before she passed out every time, he would just slightly release the pressure, but then he'd ask her to swallow again. And he kept doing this again and again and again until she completely blacked out. He then dragged her onto a pile of rubbish knelt on her chest and strangled her until she passed out a final time. And he left her for dead. It wasn't like he thought she was gonna come round. He thought that he had killed her. Simple as that. Now, only a month later, Little actually attempted to murder another woman, Tonya Jackson. So this is in within just four weeks. This is in the same location. The police were patrolling, fortunately, because the lot itself was a place where a lot of drug use and prostitution occurred. So at this point, they spot a car matching the description of the car that had been involved in the attack on Laurie a month earlier. So the police go over, put on the lights to look in the car, and they see this large black male. He immediately gets out of the vehicle. That black male is later identified as Samuel Little. They acknowledged that he looked nervous, and at this point, he basically says he's had a fight with his wife. He's a mad jury wife that just conveniently has been introduced to this story. I just have had an argument with my wife. That's why I look nervous and I'm in a particular place where drugs and prostitutes are. It makes perfect sense. But that's what he said. So the officer then obviously does the whole shines a light in the car to have a look around. And it's at that point he's met with the most horrific sight. There is a woman that is unconscious and naked inside. Now the officer later stated in court, one leg was up over the seat, the other leg was on the rear passenger seat in the rear of the car. Her upper torso and her head were crammed down on the floorboard between the seat portion of the driver's seat and the seat portion of the rear seat. I saw a black bra but not attached on her chest. Her lips and her mouth were bloody. It looked like she'd been punched or beaten. And that victim had bruises on her face, her neck, 
Her eyes had rolled back into her head. She was completely unresponsive. She was gasping and gulping for air. And she later told the authorities that, as we would expect, he'd raped and strangled her. Samuel Little claimed, however, that he had paid her for sex and she hadn't satisfied him. In fact, he said she only played with it. And he told her, apparently, that that wasn't acceptable. He said, she wasn't going anywhere until I got my pussy. And then he claimed that he grabbed her in self-defense and that she deserved it. She cheated him. I don't think you can grab somebody in self-defense and then say she deserved it because that suggests that you had an intention, doesn't it, Samuel Little? You had an intention to harm her. We all know you did. Whilst he was actually being driven to custody, he asked the officers, bear in mind what he's just done and what he's potentially being caught for, would you be having this conversation? He said to them, how's the bitch? Is she going to make it? I mean, how little care and consideration has he got for the legal system? He's not scared. He just wanted to know whether he'd managed to do what he wanted to do. Simple as that. Now, again, you're going to be like, right, surely, bang to rights, yeah? Victim, in car, naked, almost dead. Yeah? Obvious. Police were there. Police were there, right? So this is just life, yeah? No. No. Ended in a mistrial ended in a mistrial. How? I mean, literally, if there is a scenario where you are going to get caught bang to rights, it's when the police catch you doing it. The police is the witness. No, mistrial. So basically, Little pleads guilty to a lesser offense of aggravated assault against Laurie and Tonya. So both of those crimes, aggravated assault. I mean, that's horrific for the victims. After what they went through, they were both nearly murdered. They were both horribly raped. And yet he gets aggravated assault. He got four years. He served two of those four years. You see what I said at the beginning about you're going to find this frustrating. So after these two years, it's extensive sentence of two years for all but murdering two women. He gets out of prison and straight away back to his life of crime. Why wouldn't he? Ask yourself, why wouldn't he? It served him very well. And he's basically been able to cause a great amount of harm and chaos. And it just hasn't resulted in him in any way, shape or form facing serious consequences. That life of crime means that in 2000, he serves two years for attempted armed robbery of a store. He also serves 14 months for another offence in 2013. So obviously he's been in and out of prison. So he was a suspect in various crimes over the years. And these included things like sexual assaults, murders, attempted murders. He served multiple straw sentences in prison, so he was kind of constantly in and out, but he never really got any serious convictions. So even though he was in and out of prison, and in fact, he amassed a 100 page rap sheet and he was arrested more than 50 times in 24 different states. And in a life of crime that actually spread over 56 years, and yet, in spite of all of that that I've just described, the amount of incarceration that he'd actually face was less than 10 years. So we're talking like nearly six decades of criminal behavior. And obviously, I'm going to cover the murders shortly and how on earth all these women came to die after having a rap sheet like that and after nearly murdering two women that the courts were aware of. I have no idea. But that is what we're dealing with. And he only got, in all of those six decades, around 10 years in prison. So he did very well from crime, didn't he? He got away with things very, very effectively. And it's not even that he's a clever criminal. Yeah, he's nomadic. This is more systemic failures within a system. That's what it represents. Because he should never have been walking the streets. So this guy is a dangerous sexual predator. We know that. But somehow he gets convicted of a very few sexual offences, in fact. This was, on reflection, reprehensibly too, down to the victims that he decided to select. 
they were basically witnesses that wouldn't make a good court case. So when he got victims, he thought about the victims who literally were going to be individuals, if they were put on a stand, that the jury would judge very, very harshly or they would be under the influence. Therefore, they wouldn't be seen as witnesses that could essentially give evidence. And that was a way of making sure that he got away with a lot of these crimes. He basically dealt with people who had credibility issues. And a lot of those credibility issues actually led to them not even turning up to court to testify. So even if it got that far, he unfortunately wouldn't get sentenced because they just didn't come. But in spite of all of this, you will be glad to know that Little's past would catch up with him. September the 5th, 2012. Why do I have a smile on my face? I always have a smile on my face when I think about talking about justice. I can't help myself. It's like it would catch up with him. Not soon enough, but it did at least catch up with him. So basically, he's living in a homeless shelter at 72 years of age, in fact. So he's managed to get through all of his life, but now he's in a homeless shelter and he gets arrested. And he even gets extradited to California because there are drugs charges waiting for him. So they take a DNA sample. Now by this time, Samuel Little is a sick old man. He's diabetic, he's got heart problems. In fact, he's confined to a wheelchair. It's at this point whilst in custody, he was linked through DNA to a 1987 murder and to two further murders in 1989. All three of the women were actually killed in Los Angeles. So let's go back to these killings in Los Angeles. So the 13th of July, 1987, so this call is to report the dead body of an African-American woman that's lying in an alleyway. She's naked from the waist down. Her shirt's been pulled up over her bra. There's drag marks in the dirt. That indicates that she's clearly been killed somewhere else. That woman was later identified as 41-year-old Linda Alford. And it was her daughter who acknowledged that it was Linda's body. The autopsy, when that was looked at, revealed that she was killed by manual strangulation. She had multiple bruises near her jawline. She had hemorrhages in and around the eyes. Anybody who has ever tried holding the breath for a long time, you can rupture the vessels in your eyes. She had hemorrhage into a voice box and hyoid bone. She also had scratches and abrasions to her neck, some caused by fingernails. She had hemorrhaging beneath the scalp and temporal area, which was consistent with having been punched in the head. The toxicology report indicated that she consumed alcohol and cocaine. She also had semen found on a shirt and that matched little. And the odds of that match were, wait for it, one in 450 quintillion. I didn't even know there was a thing called a quintillion. Imagine that Elon Musk and Bill Gates are probably gonna be there soon though. The analyst actually stated it would take approximately 64 billion planet Earths to find this DNA profile one time. Yeah, pretty rare, pretty rare. 64 billion planet Earths to find this DNA profile one time. 14th of August, 1989, again, the Los Angeles police get another call. The police are informed of a homicide in a parking lot behind a nightclub and they find a body of a Caucasian woman. She's naked from the waist down. Her sweatshirt is pulled up around her shoulders. Again, there's drag marks on her back, on her buttocks and heels. So like the other murder, it seems that she's been murdered elsewhere. That body was later identified as 35-year-old Audrey Nelson and the autopsy once again concluded that this murder had involved strangulation. There was significant bruising around the front of the neck, um, fractures to the thyroid cartilage and hyoid bone. She had severe hemorrhaging to her throat muscles and there was fingernail marks on the right side of her throat. So again, very consistent with the other crime. And the medical examiner stated, these signs of force are the greatest that I have ever seen in my 27 year practice in a country which has its fair share of strangulation cases. So we can tell absolute brute force has been used. Also blunt force trauma. And that blunt force trauma seemed to be consistent with somebody being punched repeatedly in the head. She had severe bruising underneath her skin. It extended into her chest muscles, stomach and abdomen, and also 
the hard bone of her spine had actually been crushed during a blow to the upper central abdomen with deep bruising to the stomach itself. Just think about that as considerable force was used there. The toxicology report revealed the presence of cocaine in her blood and the fingernail clippings from her left hand tested positive for blood and it was found to contain Little's DNA. In fact, again, odds of this being from someone else were, wait for it, one in 58.68 quadrillion. It's the word that I've learned in my research. So it's not gonna be somebody else, is it? Little is definitely the individual who's carried out these crimes. 3rd of September, 1989, the Los Angeles police responded to a call homicide at an abandoned car repair garage. Again, body naked from the waist down. So we're seeing this consistent theme. This victim was identified as 46 year old Guadalupe Apodaca and she died as a result of manual strangulation. She had abrasions and bruising to her neck and around her throat that were caused by fingernails, fractures to the larynx and hyoid bone, she had bleeding on her eyelids and the whites of her eyes, bruising around her eyes and nose, and she had lacerations to the lower lip. She had bruising on her tongue, which indicated she'd bitten down on it when she was suffering a seizure due to strangulation, which is horrific to imagine. She also had bruising on her chest, and that was consistent with somebody kneeling on her whilst they were strangling her. Imagine that, having somebody with full weight on your chest. I mean, that in itself makes it difficult to breathe, but it also renders you completely incapable of doing anything because their sheer weight stops you. She had bruises to her forehead, around her eyes, again, consistent with blunt force trauma, so likelihood was she was repeatedly punched. She'd suffered a sexual assault. She had blood in her anal cavity, and the toxicology report revealed that she had cocaine and alcohol in her blood. The DNA found on her shirt matched Little's DNA profile. So the medical examiner noted similarities in all three deaths, which are obvious. You don't need to be a medical examiner, do you, to do that? Oh, these three bodies, all who've had the same injuries, all turning up in the same area. Hmm, could it be a serial killer? Yes, it was. So the profile of the victim was very similar. The victim was always a woman, aged between around 35 and 46, strangled manually. There was blunt trauma, so they were all severely beaten. Nude from the waist down. Also, they were left posed with their genitals exposed. And they were found in South Central Los Angeles. All of them as well had cocaine in their blood. So for the medical examiner, this clearly seemed to be a linked crime. They were looking for a serial killer. And essentially, even though we're looking at many years past, you know, decades past, that DNA was the connector. So, okay, he wasn't caught at the time, he should have been, but it was great that he left this indefensible sign at all of those crimes. And it's a shame we didn't have the technology back then because that would have meant that Samuel Little served a very long time in prison or was put to death. Nonetheless, we get him and we managed to recognise that this is the same person responsible for all these crimes. So Samuel Little goes on trial for these killings in September 2014, so really not very long ago, under a decade ago, he stood trial for these, and there was just an overwhelming amount of evidence against him. DNA evidence, and that was combined with actual witness testimonies from victims who'd actually survived his attacks, because yes, he did have some survivors of his attacks. And one such survivor was Hilda Nelson. So she worked as a prostitute and she did that because she wanted to support herself and her children. 31st of July, 1980 is when she experienced the attack that nearly killed her. Little approaches her in a nightclub and she tells him at the point that she was looking for a date. That's kind of a way of saying that she wants to get paid for sex. He agrees that he will give her $50, and that means that Little and her go back to her apartment. Now, as soon as they get inside, he punched her in the back of the head and he starts choking her. She lost consciousness, and when she woke up, she was lying on her bed, and he continues to just choke her and hit her in the face. 
she loses consciousness again because obviously he's playing this game where he's putting her out and then bringing her back. And then after she wakes up, she's naked in a bath full of water and she's got a scarf tied around her neck. This is at a point where Little begins to repeatedly pull her up by the scarf and then push her head under the water. And then whilst he's doing this horrific torture, he's punching her in the face. So she passes out a third time. And when she actually came round then, so this has been serious, serious knockouts, you know? When somebody is going under for long periods of time, it can cause catastrophic damage. And the impact and it's required to do that is really high level. Aside from the fact that he's trying to drown her and bring her back, you know, going through that kind of suffocation routine, it's the violence as well that is bestowing. So on the third time when she passes out, she basically comes around the next time in hospital. So that's how much time has passed. That's how traumatized she was and her body was. She actually spent three days being treated for those injuries, but she was really embarrassed about what had happened. So instead of saying, listen, I got picked up by this guy, I went back to my flat and this happened. So they know that they're looking for somebody who's maybe procuring victims that way. She just says that a home invasion had occurred and that's what had taken place. She didn't want to admit that she was a prostitute and it doesn't surprise me because at that time, the police were not sympathetic to prostitutes. It's like this idea that because somebody is selling sex, they don't deserve the same rights or somehow they're inviting trouble. That isn't a reality. When people are being prostitutes, they're not looking to be raped or murdered. They're looking to make money for whatever reason they're making that money. And they should be able to do that actually in a peaceful way and a protective way. But even when they get attacked, raped, abused, what will often happen is they'll be made to feel like they somehow invited it. And I know that people will say, well, you're putting yourself in harm's way. Yeah, people are. But again, it's not because they're the problem. It's because there are these predators around that make it a problem. And even then, for the very most part, the majority of prostitutes don't end up in these situations because the majority of people procuring prostitutes aren't psychopathic serial murderers. But it's unfair that we don't treat even now. And I will say that I don't believe that authorities treat prostitutes now very much differently to how they did before. I know that there are opportunities for people to get the help. I know that courts do take people to court on occasion, but I still think it's really difficult for working girls to get the same attention that they deserve because they are mothers, sisters, daughters, friends, and so on and so forth. Their lives have great meaning. Now, another witness was Leela McLean. She was a prostitute supporting her three children and her attack happened on the 19th of November, 1981. So she gets picked up by Little on the street and he tells her that he's taking her to the Shamrock Hotel. She actually realizes pretty early on that something's gonna go wrong because he drives past the hotel and she's just like, please turn around. She knows that something bad's gonna happen. Little replied to her, I don't need to turn around for what I want to do to you. And then he punches her in the back of the head and then between the eyes, he stops the car and then he just continues repeatedly punching her. Then he begins choking the life out of her. Now she actually manages, manages to escape from the car multiple times. So she is fighting for her life, but each time he manages to drag her back in. And at one point, a boy on a bike rides past and he actually asked her if she needed help. I mean, what an incredible hero that this kid on a bike feels like she needs help and wants to intervene. But because she was being so attacked, she actually couldn't speak because of the pressure on her throat. So Little tells the boy on the bike that she was his old lady and was drunk. Somehow, however, this woman, this incredible woman, finally manages to escape through the car window and she ran into the traffic wearing only her shorts. And that tells you, doesn't it, how terrified she was. She put her life at risk. She would rather run into a busy road of traffic than to be anywhere near Samuel Little. Now, fortunately, someone actually stopped the car and they took her to hospital. 
She didn't initially report the incident to the police. Again, how many women who are sex workers, who are raped, don't feel that they can actually tell the police because they feel that they're gonna get judged. They feel like they caused it and it's awful because they're victims per se. There was another witness as well, Laurie Barros. And again, she survived her encounter with Samuel Little in his car in September 1984. And she actually told the court this, I really knew this was not about rape. It wasn't about assault. It was about death, power and control, whether or not I was gonna live. So the prosecution, well, they argued all of the evidence pointed to firstly, a very distinctive criminal pattern, sexual satisfaction through torturing their victim via manual strangulation and that the perpetrator, Samuel Little, really enjoyed watching them fight for the next breath. They said, it's all about power and control. That's what it was all about. It's a game. This defendant, he doesn't want consensual sex. That's not how he gets off. He wants to be able to overpower his victims. He wants to play God. That's why he gets sexual gratification from, from watching these women struggle to breathe lose consciousness and eventually die. Now you won't be surprised at all to find out that on the 25th of September 2014, he was found guilty and sentenced to three life terms without the possibility of parole. Now as he was wheeled out of courtroom, he raised his fist in the air defiantly. Don't get me started on that, because there's a little bit in my brain that's like, Samuel Little was living in a homeless shelter in his 70s at the end of the day, going to prison where you get fed three square meals a day, where you're warm, where you're relatively comfortable, where you've got people to chat to. You know, old age can be deeply lonely. And to some degree, I feel like Samuel Little really wasn't getting a punishment there. It kind of grates on me. I'm very glad that he was off the streets, but this is an incapacitated, incapable man. He isn't actually a danger to society anymore. And I would like to see him struggle in his final years. And I don't think prison would have offered him a place where that struggle would have been real. My personal feeling. Also at this point, he's basically saying, it's unfair. I'm totally innocent. I didn't do any of this, even though they had to invent a new number for my DNA, quadrillion. Probably didn't exist until my DNA got involved in that and they just made it up. They were like, Samuel Little, we're gonna have to invent a whole new DNA number, but it will be useful because after the pandemic, Elon Musk and Bill Gates and quite a lot of people on vaccine panels will all be needing this number for their bank balance. So he's maintaining his innocence at this moment in time. But in 2018, Little ends up getting interviewed in his cell in Lancaster, California by Texas Ranger, James Holland. And this is where the floodgates open. He gets questioned and he just starts confessing to loads and loads more killings. So between June, 2018 and December, 2020, Little is interviewed extensively by Holland. In fact, they've got about 700 hours of interviews in total. You can look quite a lot up online and it is really interesting to listen to them. And Holland obviously has to build rapport and he ends up doing that by calling him Sammy. Now, Sammy was the name that Samuel Little's family and friends would use. So only his inner circle would ever call him Sammy. And he actually hadn't been called it for many, many years. But in doing so and making him feel that Holland liked him, he just started to talk about what he'd done. And he went into incredible detail about every single victim. Now, bear in mind the amount of time that had passed, you wouldn't imagine that somebody's memory would be that good. And also he's senior in his years and he's not had the easiest of lives as far as attention medically and so on. So to have a really good memory at this point wouldn't necessarily be something that we'd expect. But he has this unique quality among serial killers with respect, because a lot of the time we imagine that serial killers talk about their crimes 
and they might have the names, but they're less concerned with the victims in that respect. They're kind of throwaway, aren't they? But it's not the case with him. He has this almost photographic memory and he's actually able to describe where he met his victims, where he killed them, where he left their bodies, and also what they looked like. He was actually able to draw portraits of 26 of the women that he claimed to have killed. And it is worth noting that he only ever drew the victims' faces and necks. That has to be another nod, doesn't it, to his neck fetish? That's about him concentrating his reflection and fantasy on that area. Now, we'll note that his descriptions were not always 100% accurate. You know, he reflected and remembered quite a lot, but they could actually be out by like 10 years and also by around 40 miles when they were talking about locating the body. But I mean, I can't even remember what I was doing three days ago. And I always worry about that because I'm like, you know, when people get questioned in interrogations, the police are really specific and they're like, where were you on May the 12th at 3 p.m.? And I'm like, I'd be in that situation. I don't know. Well, you could have been at the scene of a crime. I wasn't. How do you know? You didn't say where you were. I don't know where I was. So you were probably there. I, I definitely wasn't there. Well, you can't give us an alibi. And it sounds like that's because you were probably at the murder scene. You know what I mean? That, that's what would happen to me. But this guy can actually remember because even though there have been four decades, it's like he'd kept them with him, so to speak. Now, when he starts to talk about this, it transpired that his first murder was that of 33-year-old Mary Brosley in 1971. She was an alcoholic mother of two. She'd left her family in Massachusetts and she'd moved to Florida. Little drove her to a secluded spot that was along Route 27 and he strangled her. And he later told police, I had desires, strong desires to choke her. I just went out of control, I guess. No, I don't think you went out of control, Samuel Little. I think you're a serial killing psychopath who just likes killing. You weren't out of control. Out of control is not strangling somebody and then bringing them back, strangling them again. And that sounds like you had a lot of control. It just is the fact that you're also a human predator who has a particular way of controlling death. So her body actually didn't get discovered for over three weeks. By the time they did discover it, well, her body was really badly decomposed. And even though the death was clearly suspicious, they say suspicious, honestly, this is what it was described as, suspicious. She's in a shallow grave. It's a little bit suspicious. Well, I mean, I'm just gonna suggest for a minute that a shallow grave is indicative of somebody literally digging it to put the person, the person who is going to be murdered or found dead isn't digging the grave themselves. You're not like, oh, I've got a few problems, I'm just gonna dig myself a shallow grave and die in there. That never happens. But nonetheless, even though she's found in said shallow grave, the initial autopsy basically concludes that she died of alcohol poisoning. But she just conveniently died of alcohol poisoning in a shallow grave. And if she died of alcohol poisoning, and somebody had found her, they'd have been like, ah, oh, just get the authorities. They wouldn't be like, oh my God, she's dead. Huh, we're never gonna be able to afford that crematorium or burial. We're just gonna have to do it here. I mean, who was the person doing the initial autopsy? Literally, how did that happen? And I've watched a lot of the confessions and they are very disconcerting. And I'll tell you why. We've watched Serial killers tell their stories many times. I'm sure a lot of you listening have watched Ted Bundy, BTK, Green River Killer, so on and so forth. Richard Ramirez, I have, because I like watching them. And don't get me wrong, they like the sound of their own voice and they often romanticize to some degree what they've learned or they indeed compact further why they did what they did. Often they show remorse, shall we say. Little isn't like that. Little smiles quite wistfully whilst he's recounting the murder of these women that he literally brutally attacked. I mean, his murders were utterly brutal. And it's almost like he's dealing with nostalgia. 
Like he's just reminiscing about these old times that they had together. So it's more like a memory of something of meaning than a memory of murder. So we are listening to a man describing how he extinguished the lives of these young, innocent women. And he's just kind of like enjoying the memory. Now, Little actually confessed to 93, you're right, I said it, 93 murders across 19 states. And he claimed to have murdered them and strangled them between 1970 and 2005. That's 35 years he was active as a serial killer. And I know that lots of us could say, well, he could be exaggerating. Well, he could be, but they verified more than 60 of these so far. Those confessions were actually matched to victims through DNA evidence or were extensively corroborated through the interviews. So they were able to say, well, whilst there wasn't DNA, he knew exactly where this person was. He remembered the description of them and they were dumped in an area that was very similar to what he's talking about. So they were able to corroborate those. The FBI have actually confirmed that Little is to be the most prolific serial killer in US history so far. I mean, he's evidence, isn't he? That somebody can be a serial killer and kill numerous, numerous women and get away with it for a very long time. That there could be others out there. There are certainly a lot of Jane Doe's in America where we've never been able to link the actual victim with the perpetrator. And there've been many individuals who've been found dead that they've never had a perpetrator attached to. Now, many of his victims' deaths, just like his first, were actually not originally identified as homicides. Some were mistakenly put down as overdoses, accidental deaths, I did just punch myself in my head and strangle myself. Like I said, when I talked about systemic failures, you're looking at them and hearing about them now. This is just about profiling somebody and then being shoddy about your work around it. This is just about having a bias against prostitutes. It's like, oh, well, it's a prostitute, probably cocaine, probably alcohol. Well, maybe the bruises and the clear signs of sexual assault could maybe have identified that you should have looked a little bit deeper there, but they didn't. So these got written off. Now, obviously what we know about Lil is that he was absolutely prolific in his killing. He believed fully that he could kill indiscriminately and he could get away with it. Now, another reason for Little's incredibly high kill count was just down to aspects of his MO. So how did he do it? How did he manage to sustain killing so many people over so many years and get away with it? Well, first of all, as I've said, he was really good at choosing his victims. You know what we always say about serial killers? They have told us they go for available desirable and vulnerable. They're the three qualities they look for in a victim. So if he saw a prostitute that was desirable to him, well, they were also available and they were highly vulnerable. He picked the perfect population to attack. He targeted mostly young, disadvantaged black women. More than three quarters of his victims were African-American. They included sex workers, drug addicts, homeless people, and also people who were suffering with mental health issues. He would go out of his way to pick them up from clubs, in bars, on street corners. And his words, he stated this, they were broke and homeless and they walked right in to my spider web. I mean, at least he described himself appropriately because he was that kind of predator. And he believed that the authorities just genuinely didn't care if prostitutes turned up dead. And as he said, especially black prostitutes. That's what he told authorities. He actually said this, I'm not gonna go over there into the white neighborhood and pick out a little teenage girl. I mean, how horrific is that? That he can actually see that there was a distinction between the way that black women who were killed or went missing were treated than white women. That is really scary to acknowledge. And with respect, he was absolutely correct in his belief. 
you know, their deaths received very little publicity, so much so that it kind of reinforced his actions. So he would frequently go back to the same bars, the same clubs, the same streets that he procured his past victims, and he'd get another victim, just like he had with Laurie and Tonya. And he said this, I'd go back to the same city sometimes and pluck me another grape. How many grapes do you all got on the vine here? Even making that joke, how many grapes have I got on that vine that he's carrying with him, his mental vine, the knowledge that each one symbolises a human life. He also described his victims as succulent fruits he could enjoy without penalty. I told you about that. I told you this is a man who does not care about consequences because they have not been stern at all. He feels above the law. In one interview, he describes the murder of 38-year-old prostitute, heroin addict, and mother of two Denise brothers. I think it's important to always bring in the fact that, yes, she was a heroin dependent. Yes, she was a prostitute, but she was also a parent. And he recalled that she was crying in the back of his car. He told her, I own you, you're mine forever. And he kissed the tears from her face before killing her. And he said that he wanted to see their helplessness. He said, all I ever wanted was for them to cry in my arms. I mean, Samuel Little, you are the most unbelievably selfish human I think I've come across because the ego that he demonstrates in that, all about him, all of us know that the natural response when somebody is crying is to wrap your arms around someone, to soothe them, to comfort them. But for him, he provoked the pain, he caused the tears, but then he enjoyed the experience. And the fact that as opposed to soothing her, he suffocated her, he strangled her, it demonstrates such a lack of understanding and empathy. And I know that we appreciate that psychopathic serial killers don't have empathy in the way that you or I would, but that ownership, that sense of knowing that you hold the balance of life and death in your hands and you choose to take the life, it's just beyond reprehensible. Also worth noting that the crimes I've talked about, a lot of them involved obviously being very violent and punches and causing such terrible impact that people were knocked unconscious. Turned out that he was a self-proclaimed middleweight prize fighter. Look, whatever, whether that's true or not, he was definitely an amateur boxer. So he had potential without a doubt. And he learned to box in prison. So there you go. Send somebody to prison. What happens? They come out even more violent than they went in. And when they looked, back at the crimes and they kind of explored them a little bit more. It was as if, for the majority of them at least, he gave one single knockout punch immediately when he was procuring his victim to incapacitate them. So that's all he needed. They weren't ready for it and he would punch them in a certain way in a certain place and it would just render them completely unconscious. And to be fair, this is also potentially why so many of his victims were never considered homicides because there hadn't been signs of a struggle. Although I do, I do draw the line at somebody being found in a shallow grave, but I digress, I digress. I just can't leave that one behind. I can't leave the was found in shallow grave. It was alcohol poisoning. I can't leave that one behind. But there hadn't been a sign of a struggle and obviously he incapacitated them this way. So there wouldn't have been. As I've noted, most of the time, Samuel Little had sex with his victims before actually killing them. But Little likes to tell a different kind of story. When he reflects on these accounts, apparently the sex was consensual. I mean, absolute bollocks, because he beat them before sexually assaulting them. That's not consensual. It might be in his head, but it's not consensual. Also, he noted that sometimes he did actually have sex with the bodies post-mortem. And he also, at times, wanted to bite them. So he'd bite his victims as well. The way he killed his victims also actually helped him to remain undetected. And I'll tell you why. Rather than typical strangulation, 
he actually employed more of a suffocation technique. That's why on the coroner's report, the hyoid bones in the throat weren't always broken or damaged. Now that particular break in the hyoid tends to be the telltale sign that somebody's died by strangulation. But because he was a lust killer, he used to take time strangling them by masturbating whilst he was strangling his victims. In fact, this is why he became known as the choke and stroke killer. So he boasted to authorities how when he murdered his victims, he used to take a lot of time. He drew it out, it was a long and slow process. So he'd let his victims slip in and out of consciousness. He got this real sexual pleasure from their deaths being dragged out and being slow. So when Samuel Little was questioned about the way he killed, etc., he said that all of his victims were strangled aside from two whom he drowned. During the actual interrogations, he was absolutely insistent that he never shot or stabbed any of the women that he killed. And this actually meant that many of his crimes were misidentified. After he actually killed them, he would also often move their bodies just to another location. And that be why they had those scrape marks on the backs and buttocks. And you see this with serial killers, particularly organized ones. They tend to procure a victim in one place, kill them in another place, and then dump their body elsewhere. And he kind of follows that pattern. And it is interesting with respect to when you listen to Little in his video confessions, because there's this psychological minimization just about the brutality of his crimes. I mean, I've described to you guys exactly what he did. And you will all be aware that those deaths were brutal and drawn out and horrific, but he just minimizes them. So when he's talking about them and confessing to the murders, he basically implies that the victims were either people that he solicited and that they were on a date with him, right? So it was all consensual and it was just going fine, but then suddenly he strangled them without warning. That's how he talks about it. So he doesn't go into the details. It's just basically, oh, I was with them, we were having a day, and then I killed them. But that wasn't the case. You know, the autopsies that they did on his identified victims confirmed that they'd been firstly very badly beaten, sexually assaulted violently, and then strangled to death. Little was like an animal. And I mean animal in the context of the most primordial, aggressive human that you can imagine. Because animal is not a name that I should use by suggesting that animals are horrible and brutal because animals only kill because they need to and also tend to be a lot nicer than a lot of their human counterparts. But he was somebody who just had this thirst for death. He killed an unbelievable amount of completely innocent people who were so vulnerable. You know, some would say the most vulnerable people, individuals who had addiction problems, who had to make money to feed their children. He took mothers away from their children. Their lives meant absolutely nothing to him. As far as he was concerned, they were vessels to satiate his twisted, warped desires. He killed them for one thing and one thing alone. It was for his sexual gratification. And then he just threw their bodies away like rubbish. But even when he was actually finally tried for three of these murders, he just continued to claim his innocence. You know, this is despite the most unbelievable amount of overwhelming evidence against him. Obviously, we have the video confessions. And I would hope that even though they are horrific for the victims' families to listen to, one would imagine that it will bring some closure to those victims because they will actually know what happened to their actual family members. But even though on one level I can say that that would hopefully draw a line knowing whether your family member had disappeared or indeed been murdered by Samuel Little and you have that kind of acknowledgement that yes, this person died this way. I have to say when you look at those videos and he's talking, they seem very self-serving. And I think that one, he enjoyed talking per se about the crimes. That's why he minimizes it. You know, he's doing it for himself. He's reflecting on these wistful, nostalgic memories of these dates that just went wrong. 
but also he only agreed to make those confessions in exchange for a transfer out of the Los Angeles County prison where he'd been being held. So it wasn't about remorse. It wasn't about guilt. It wasn't about telling people what they needed to know. It was just completely about him getting what he wanted. And I think that you should be able to make a deal with a serial killer in prison when they want something. And then after they've given you what they wanted to give you and what you wanted to get from them, you go, yeah, I was lying. <laughs> you're not moving. In fact, you're being moved to solitary and you're only going to be fed bread and water. And it won't even be nice bread. It won't be sourdough. It will be just your basic bargain basement, just out of date, sliced white. That's it. That's what I'd have done. Well, no, nonetheless, he was able to make that deal. So even though he clearly enjoyed recounting the gruesome details, even though we know that he was doing this for himself, at the end of the day, they made that deal with him. And thankfully, it seems the FBI agents agreed with my state of play. I kidded you a little bit there, didn't I? I kidded you. You thought he got his transfer. No, he didn't. <laughs> Sorry. It turns out you can lie to serial killers. And they did. And I love that. So basically, he never got granted his transfer. Oh, it's sad, isn't it? Oh, poor Samuel Little. He got duped. He got outwitted by the FBI. What a shame. As I said earlier on, I think one of the biggest problems with this particular crime is the fact that the states that he was in, because he was going from place to place, there was no connecting of the dots. Because if they talked to each other and they discussed women turning up dead, if this had been a nationwide media campaign, it wouldn't have taken long for them to realize that these crimes had the same MO. And that would have most likely meant that they'd have recognized the need to apprehend a serial killer. But because they didn't do that, he was just able to kill indiscriminately for over three decades. Three decades. And they're the ones we know about, aren't they? They're the ones that we actually know about, the ones he's confessed to. On the 30th of December, 2020, Little died in California, aged 80. He'd been suffering from heart problems and diabetes. Now, in spite of the fact that he's confessed to a lot of murders, the identity of almost half of his victims is still unknown. And his death means that the victim's families are gonna never have closure. Also, you might be glad to know that at the time of his death, he was unable to walk and he was in constant pain. When Samuel Little actually took his last breath, the only people that were present were his guards who were actually watching over him. Yeah, he died in pain, incarcerated, alone. But somehow, in spite of that, he still manages to get a better death than those victims. He still managed to live out his last breath to some degree peacefully and safely. Quite the contrary experience of each one of those women that he slayed. The end of last year, the Texas Rangers, that's the FBI's violent criminal apprehension program and the US Department of Justice, well, they released new details in more than a dozen murders committed by Little because it's hopeful that it will bring closure to as many families as possible. Now, of those unsolved cases, they include the following. Around 1996, in Los Angeles, California, Little met a five foot five tall, 200 pound, heavy set, 23 to 24 year old black female prostitute. Apparently she was very popular. All the children in the area knew her name and she agreed to go on a date with him. He took her to a hamburger stand. She was wearing a black dress with a split up the side and no underwear. He strangled her to death in the parking lot. He dragged her body into an alleyway that was full of rubbish. He placed her body on the pile of decaying garbage and placed a decaying mattress on top of her. Another, around 1996, Los Angeles, California, Samuel Little met a five foot tall, 100 pound, 23 to 25 year old white female with blonde hair and blue eyes at a homeless camp. She was basically a heroin user. She had needle marks on her arms and stomach after digitally penetrating her in a motel, they then went to a crack house to buy some crack cane. During this time, she left for about 15 minutes with two black men. She then came back crying, saying that they had both had sex with her. 
Little and that woman then go to a vacant house and it's here, he strangles her to death in a bathroom. He then recalled that he removed her jeans and tennis shoes and attempted to have post-mortem anal sex with her, which he was unable to do. So he placed her in a bath sitting up. He then said he carefully wiped down his fingerprints and was careful to avoid leaving any footsteps in the dust when he left. Also, 1987, this is all his recollections. So there are people out there who need to hear this because these are people who he killed. So 1987, Los Angeles, California, he met a five foot seven tall, 140 pound, 26 to 27 year old black female. She just got out of prison. He walked her to a bus stop with her. That's where they had sex. He later gave her some money to buy food. Then whilst he went inside, he went to speak to his girlfriend. Remember who I talked about earlier? He had a girlfriend. The short time after that, the woman basically knocks on his door. So then Little drives her down a dirt road behind a park through woods. He strangles her there and he lays her body by a tree. He recalls in 1984, again, Los Angeles, California, met a black female, 5'5 five, five tall, weighed around 120 to 130 pounds. He said she got out of some guy's car and he drove off. He then killed her, had sex with her dead body alongside a highway before dragging her halfway up a hill. And he actually later read that authorities had found a body and they had presumed that she had been thrown off the highway and then rolled down there. Again, this complete inability to see that these were murder victims was really problematic. He recalled that in 1971 or 1972 in Miami, Florida, he met an 18 to 19-year-old girl, about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, tall, about 135 to 140 pound, said that it was a good-looking black male who presented himself as a woman and was dressed as a drag queen called Marianne. Said that met her at a bar called the Pool Palace, and again a few days later in a bar in Overtown, offered him her a lift home, went into a house in the projects that was where he was with several other drag queens and one of his roommates actually asked them to buy a can of Magic Shave shaving cream. These are his recollections. On the way, Little said that he pulled into a driveway and choked him or her to death in his car and then basically drove them to the Everglades and dumped their body in thick, muddy water. And he believed that the body was never found. I've used him, her there because he refers to them as a drag queen, but I don't know whether it's somebody who's actually transsexual. So just to kind of acknowledge that they might have been looking less for a drag artist and more for somebody who was presenting as a female and indeed wanted to be a female. Those in itself, I chose them to describe to you because you can hear, can't you? He knows these details. He knows the fact that he picked them up in certain places, what they weighed, their age. He's drawn them. He's described them. He genuinely seems to be able to connect with what he did on the level of who he procured. But when it comes down to the actual murders, he just doesn't have any connection to them. It's like the killing didn't really matter because he doesn't actually go through what he did. But those that I've talked about there, they're crimes that have been unsolved. And it's really important that we carry on talking about them because there have to be families out there of people that they've never seen their mothers again and they've just not known whether they've walked out on them or bodies have been found and nobody knows who they are and this man is responsible for them. I think one of the most important things to take out of this particular crime that I've covered today is the fact that society just does not treat victims of crime equally. I mean, he was able to purposefully and willfully select vulnerable, damaged people. And that demonstrates the fact that we're not caring about vulnerable, damaged people. The people who actually survived his attacks, well, most of those cases never even went to court because the authorities felt that they wouldn't make credible witnesses. Well, you know what? Why not give them a shot? Because 90 odd women died mainly because of the fact that people were not considered credible to be witnesses. So cases never got put forward. I mean, that in itself is horrific. Just because somebody is a sex worker, a drug addict or a homeless person doesn't mean that their life doesn't matter or when they're attacked horribly, it shouldn't be dealt with. 
It's the perfect example of victim blaming because even the ones who are brave enough, and you have to be brave when you're living that way to go to the police and acknowledge what's happened to you because you know that you will be judged. And that's exactly what happened. They felt that they were the ones being judged. So let's be honest, the majority of people who were victim to Sam Little, but actually managed to survive, very few would ever have reported the crimes against them. They'll have known that there probably wasn't any point. That's a terrible indictment of our society, isn't it? And a criminal justice system is there to treat people equally. It should be there, actually, above everything else, to protect the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable members of society. God, that's exactly why it should be there. It's ironic, isn't it? The criminal justice system should have protected the most vulnerable individuals because it's vulnerable individuals that people like Samuel Little profile. That's who he targeted. However, the unequal treatment that still prevails today, that meant that Little was able to kill for over three decades. That causes him to hold the dubious, infamous title of America's most prolific serial killer. And that in itself just tells you, doesn't it, how wrong that system has been. For him to have been able to get away with it for such a long time and to now hold this title, it wasn't because he was clever. He wasn't a sophisticated serial killer. He left evidence lots of times. It's the fact that no one was looking for him. That's the bigger thing that we have to analyze. It was the fact that no one was looking for him. And in fact, when you actually consider women turning up in exactly the same positions, in different states, same deaths, same poses, but all too often, they were just ignored because they were prostitutes, put down to a different type of death, or just acknowledged that they'd been murdered without any real fight to bring the person to justice because you know at the end of the day, that's the kind of stuff that happens to prostitutes, sex workers in general, drug addicts, people who are homeless. It's ridiculous, it's broken. That perspective is broken. And it's why he managed to get away with it for such a long time. I hope that you found this interesting to find out a little bit more about this man who is now known as the most prolific serial killer in the States. I hope that we'll never hear of one as prolific again. I hope that the systems are working better, but I do fear that these particular vulnerable communities are still gonna be the individuals that most of the time fall foul of these kind of people and often don't get the investigations that they deserve. Like I said, you might have known about Samuel Little, but certainly for me, I didn't know the details that I've discovered and it's intrigued me, particularly the psychology of him not being able to remember the actual killings or not wanting to talk about the actual killings in detail, but being very able to describe and in fact draw the pictures of the women that he murdered. Also, when you listen to him in his interviews, one of the things that he constantly talks about is the fact that he now owns the women. His belief is that when he dies, they'll all just be his. He'll kind of be reunited with them. Well, Samuel, I imagine that if you are reunited with said individuals that you've murdered, it will be temporary whilst they just get to, you know, hit you with the first burning stokes of hell. Maybe God will sort that one out. Here you go. Have a few hot items that are deeply heated up and can be inserted in certain cavities. And you just have the first five minutes before we let good old Lucifer take over, chaps. That's kind of how it works in my head anyway, you know. New Testament, all about love. Old Testament, hail and brimstone. Fire, damnation. Samuel Little, they're throwing the Old Testament of you, mate, and we're letting all your victims have just that 30 seconds before you're taken down permanently. But that was his mindset, that he was gonna own them, that they belonged to him. Warped, misguided, completely wrong, and certainly delusional. I suppose that's all gonna make us smile just a tiny bit that Samuel Little didn't get what he wanted in the end. Join me again for another true crime next time. Give me a like, get your notifications on, subscribe if you haven't. Oh, merch is out in red. Always saying, we listen to you, we give you what you want. Thanks again to all my Patreon subs. I appreciate you, you're helping me do more content and that is really, really great. Thank you very much. Take care, see you soon, be safe.